Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. President Bola Tinubu has conferred posthumous national honors on the 17 military personnel who were killed in Okwama, Delta State. Tinubu made the announcement during the state burial of the officers at the National Military Cemetery in Abuja. He led a delegation which included senior members of his cabinet, national assembly leaders, military service chiefs, and heads of other security agencies in the country. The burial party marched in procession as soldiers carried the remains of the fallen heroes with family members and colleagues looking on soberly. Tinubu saluted the courage of the soldiers and honored the four senior officers with the award of member of the Order of Niger, MON, and the 13 other soldiers with the Order of the Federal Republic. Each man now belongs to the hallowed list of service men and women who defended our country and protected their fellow Nigerians, not minding the risk to their own lives. They have all been awarded now. A posthumous national honor. The four gallant officers have been accorded the award of members of the Order of Niger, M-O-N. The 13 courageous soldiers who also lost their lives have been awarded the Officers of the Federal Republic Medal. I commiserate with the families of our fallen heroes and the entire armed forces. I share in their pain and grief, the grief you carry today. It is my prayer that God will comfort all who are bereaved as a result of this tragedy. I consider it the most barbaric act any citizen or community can commit against the authority of the state. And I must place on record that a lot of restraints have been exercised so far in our search and recovery efforts for missing arms, ammunition, other equipment, and body parts. Your Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the Okoma killing has added to the care of the Nigerian army and by extension the Nigerian state 10 widows three of whom are four five and eight months pregnant 21 orphans and many other dependents which include parents meanwhile the joy youth council says it will hold the military responsible if anything happens to elder statesman Edwin Clark, Clark's country home in Kiagudo, Delta State, was invaded by the military last week. The Ijo Youth Council described the invasion as an insult to the Ijo people and E.K. Clark's personality. It happened over allegations of abhorring one of the suspects involved in the killing of military personnel in Delta State. Joining us now from Abuja is King Bubabraye. Dakolo, a former military officer and chairman by ESA Traditional Rulers Council. Uh, Your Highness, thank you very much for joining us on the morning show. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. Well, I mean, uh, quickly, as a former military officer, how do you feel about officers and other ranks uh, being slaughtered while they were on an active peace mission. And then, as a traditional ruler, yesterday, the president uh, gave a directive that elders and traditional rulers in Delta State, and I guess the whole of the Niger Delta, have a responsibility to give up, just in case, you know, uh, those persons who committed the crime of killing uh, officers on the uh, noble assignment uh, on behalf of uh, 
Nigeria. Just those two issues to start with. Okay, um, let me tell you that uh, I've been sad from the 14th of uh, this month till this moment. Uh, what happened is a national tragedy and remains so, and everyone should see it as, as such. And um, the press particularly will need to also do what is called investigative journalism, and so that Nigerians will properly know what has transpired and then what uh, goes on. So very important. Uh, for the traditional rulers, I believe any law-abiding citizen will do his or her best to support the process of getting to the bottom of this national tragedy. I feel so sad, like I said, uh, my heart uh, bleeds, and I condole with the families of uh, those who lost um, loved ones across board, and um, also with the military for, their uh, for the tragedy. And uh, I also particularly want to condole with the military top hierarchy and then applaud them to some extent for all they have been trying to do and what they've said, uh, employing restraint, no, not to go all out and then act in manners that will not be nice. Because the truth is, there is no we and they, there is no they and we. Uh, everyone involved in this tragedy is a Nigerian. Uh, those who were, um, the soldiers who were killed are Nigerians, and uh, those who are wanted are also Nigerians. And everyone else, the people of Okuama, are Nigerians. So that is very important, uh, Mr. Dr. Bati. So that is what I will start with. Then, of course, the, um, the traditional leaders, like I said, will definitely, every law abiding citizen will definitely help. Uh, the nation in terms of uh, such and um, apprehending those who are suspected to be involved in a lawful manner. Right. I'm, I'm glad that you continue to emphasize that law-abiding citizens will, uh, will assist in this process because uh, there is a narrative, of course, that um, some of the more prominent names among this list of suspects, uh, you know, there's some names that, of course, have been circula circulated prior to this, uh, General Amagbe being one of them. The narrative is that he's untouchable, he's protected. So how, what is your take on that? How likely is it that um, he will be held accountable or he will be brought in to be able to answer questions? Okay, before I answer that, let me just give you a bit of uh, a background that I think is important uh, for this discussion. I was born at Otuabagi where the first oil well was drilled, uh, the one that was found in 1956. And then I attended, uh, I lived at the Pioneer Refinery Quarters at Alice Leme. I attended a primary school that was so close to the refinery jetty in, those, in the 70s. I live at Ekpechama Kingdom, where the biggest, or uh, your most expensive, or most valuable onshore uh, facility that belonged to Shell is located. And then I'm a member of 38th Regular Corps, and then the traditional ruler. And then the author of the riddle of the oil thief. What has just happened is what is called uh, oil-induced violence, and I think the press is not emphasizing that. Uh, the Niger Delta communities and kingdoms are oil fields that belong to private hands all this while. And from 1967, I will say, that those oil fields, which means our kingdoms and communities, have been killing fields. And so this is not the first time it's been happening. It happened during the Civil War, and after the Civil War, it happened in Odi, happened in uh, um, um, Ogoni, happened in Omuchem, and so on and so forth. And I can tell you, pockets of this type of killings have happened several times over without consequences. Will any normal human being, for instance, take a gun and point at his own soldiers, national heroes, and shoot them to death? Something is wrong. And that thing has to be unraveled because I'm more concerned about getting to the bottom and then also preventing this type of thing from recurring. 
It's, it's very important to do that. I believe strongly, because from the people I know, the, uh, the chief of defense staff is personally known to me, a well-trained, well, -trained, well uh, an excellent officer. The chief of uh, army staff is well known to me, excellent officers. I believe that they will do uh, uh, everything properly to ensure that everyone is brought to book. However, no matter how it goes, uh, Nigeria has to ensure that everybody concerned is brought to justice. Anything short of that means that we are just going to be postponing the doomsday. Because like I said before, this is not the first time. And then if we don't get to the bottom and resolve the, the major issues behind it, then we will have uh, this type of thing recording maybe in the next week or in the next month. You must understand that, uh, like I said before, it is an oil-induced violence. So it has to do with oil and gas, because that whole area may either belong to one OML 43 or 45 or something. Because my kingdom is OML 28 and expands most of Bielsa State as well as River State. So our kingdoms are essentially oil fields that belong to people. Now, those places we've uh, 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 brought in well over Three trillion dollars in the last couple of decades. If you go to this community, do they look like habitations for human beings? Do they look like places where human beings live? Are those persons who have uh, gotten so, uh, I don't know whether disillusioned or so uninformed as to take up arms to shoot military people, normal human beings? Are they supposed to be out there just roaming like normal human beings? If you are considering them normal, I have a big question mark to put there. That is very important. The communities are in squalor. They look like squalors. And so the people may not have gotten what is ordinarily supposed uh, for, for them to have to relate with people properly. Do they even know that soldiers, for instance, are there for them? So all these are fundamental. Is there sufficient uh, naira and kobo flowing in those communities, in those areas? Are the people seeing themselves as Nigerians, for instance? Do they know that they are citizens and so have rights as citizens? These are fundamental. But I believe strongly that no normal human being should shield anybody that is a suspect. After all, it is the military's duty to investigate, as far as uh, I'm concerned, and get to the bottom of this. because. Otherwise, there will be a recurrence, and uh, you never can say how worse it could get in the very near future. Okay. I'm happy you hit the nail on the head. This is more about resource, not about a communal clash. It's about resource. It's about oil. Because when you also look at it, nobody should have the temerity. A community, as you claim, that lives in Squalo, I'm not sure they can have that capacity to be able to buy the guns that can face the soldiers. No. It must be some people in the community that used the community as shield that perpetrated the attack. And these people are also going to be in the cycle of this oil. Probably let's narrow it down to bunkery. Probably let's layer it down to rivalry around bunkery. The question I'd like to ask you is, if we are seeing patterns like this, why will people like uh, E.K. Clark be affected? Why will the military now go to the home of E.K. Clark? Okay, um, thank you so much. Like I said before, I actually meant to ask that question. Is there any Nigerian that is not in the military, that is not in law enforcement, supposed to hold a gun that is not licensed? How did they get those guns if they are not military? So how did they get those guns? And if they are smuggled, what is the customs doing? Because these guns were not gotten yesterday morning, they were not gotten last week, they may not even have gotten last year. Because the use of guns to kill police, to kill soldiers and kill citizens have been going on for a long time in, the, in Nigeria as a whole and in the Niger Delta in particular for so long. So shouldn't Nigerians look at why should someone, okay, and particularly for someone who is able to shoot at a soldier, I can bet you that that is not the first time he has killed a Nigerian. It's not the first time he has shot at a law enforcement. And perhaps it's not also the first time he has been apprehended. So if he has done all of this before and was apprehended before, were apprehended before, I'm talking about the generally, were apprehended before, how come they became so free enough and so empowered enough to come back and then come and wreak that type of havoc at, uh, at Nigerian soldiers. So these are questions. Is there any human being that is not uh, uh, licensed 
uh, supposed to be in possession of a weapon. Shouldn't we also look at the custom service, for instance? Why are they all in Tinkan Island and not in places where they should be? The Nigerian police, how come they are not uh, uh, mopping up these weapons from these people? Why are they leaving their job undone and letting the military, for instance, to do their job? All these are questions that must be asked because otherwise there will be a repeat of this type of thing. And nobody, people will be talking about wanting people, wanting people. Why should anyone in the first place have a gun? that is not supposed to have a gun. And where did those guns come from? Where do they pass from? The JTF has been uh, in that general area for w well over 25 years, since 1998. So why are there guns? What is the Nigerian police doing? Will anybody that has not taken anything, for instance, have the boldness or the madness or the stupidity to want to go and face trained experts of the military didn't, don't you think that he took some amphetamines, some bad, so banned substances? Are these banned substances made in Okwama? Are they made around Okwama? Are they made in the Niger Delta? They are uh, smuggled into this country through our borders. And who polices those borders? So these are factors that must be uh, brought in. Otherwise, we are going to just be looking towards another occurrence in the next couple of weeks or months or years, as the case may be. So this, uh, this discussion should allow us properly interrogate, and so that Nigerians must know, and those who, whose those who are paid with taxpayers' monies must know that when they don't do their job, they put our soldiers at risk, they put citizens at risk. Because for me, there is no reason why any human being that is not a soldier will have a cache of weapons sitting down somewhere, feeding fat and frolicking with the high and mighty, and so on and so forth. And talking about even oil bunkering, let me shock you. I told you I'm the author of The Riddle of the Oil Thief. If you read that book, you will see this whole drama verbatim in that book. Everything about it is in that book. Now, uh, because the, the, the naked truth is, if you have my type of background, you will understand the pattern, you understand why things happen the way they happen. And Nigerians, if we must move forward, we must quickly reorganize and ensure that the right things are done. Let those who have jobs to do, federal institutions who are paid with taxpayers' money, so to speak, do their jobs so that everyone will walk free and safe. Your Highness. The, uh, what, what has been experienced in the Niger Delta? What? Yes, please. Your Highness, I was going to say, I, I, I've heard you very clearly, but 17 soldiers killed by, they are called irate youths. That's how the media has reported it. Policemen, six other policemen, also ambushed. Other, another six missing, all within a short period of time. Does this speak to the weakness of Nigeria's security agencies? We can talk about criminality, but is it that our security agencies have become so weak that officers can be killed, soldiers can be killed, policemen can be killed, Nobody is even talking about assets that have been taken away. The guns. I don't imagine that they went there, the soldiers went there empty handed. Nobody is talking about those assets. Those are important assets, very expensive assets, bought with uh, Nigerian uh, resources. So, does this speak to weakness? When you look back, do you think this military that is there now is the same military that you served? And then you talked about oil at the center of it. We've heard that repeatedly on this program. But this was, you know, something between the Jaws and the uh, Ewu robots along the Fokados uh, River. Other theories say it was a land dispute. And I have asked the question, why would the military get involved in a land dispute? Why, why would the uh, uh, Nigerian soldiers, a whole unit of the Nigerian military, get involved in uh, Omonile matters, as they call it in, uh, in Lagos here? Okay, now I have told you before that if you get distracted and think that it is a land dispute in the sense of a landlord and another landlord somewhere over cocoyam plantation or over banana tree or something, you will be missing the mark. That is, you have been misled. Like I said before, Okwama and all those communities around there belong to what is called an OML an oil mining lease or license 
that is a private business concern of some group of persons who are not from that area. As a matter of fact, they don't even care. They don't even go there. They look at the numbers of what comes out from that particular field on a daily, weekly basis. So that is the fact. The military top hierarchy has said that they are determined to find those weapons that have been stolen you know, from that particular incident. And they have to do that. But they have to do more than that. They have to ensure that they get every weapon in the possession of every person that does not have the license to do so. That is also very important, so that there is no recurrence. But going further to that, uh, from your question, uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, the last part of the question now. I asked you about the weakness of Nigerian security agencies. Yes. So now from uh, 1967, when the uh, Civil War started, the Nigerian military, uh, more or less, or the Nigerian police got cowed. And of course, over the years, you know that NSCDC has come out of the police, um, EFCC are from the police, uh, road safety from the police. Everybody comes out of the police. And there is been what is called a militarization of the Niger Delta in particular, and Nigeria in general. So the police has been so weakened that the only persons that are effective to some degree is the military. And you know, the military ordinarily are supposed to mind the territorial integrity of Nigeria, not necessarily what they are doing right there. But if you get the, the military out of that environment, for instance, you are going to have what is called wild, wild west per excellence because the police does not have the capacity. You'll be lucky to find one or two police people who could do very well, like, for instance, the uh, current commissioner of uh, police in Bielsa State. I think he, he has uh, what it takes to do what he's doing. But the one before was a big sham. And so uh, uh, the, the truth is the military is the only group of people who can do something reasonable to, uh, to ensure that there is peace and security in that part of the world for now. But should that remain forever? No. Uh, there is a reason why the military is separate from the police. Because if you have the military keep doing police job, because they are supposed to be dealing with the enemies of, state, of the state, in a while they will begin to see the citizens of the state as enemies of the state. And then, of course, you can't blame them in that case. So there has to be a deliberate way of re-empowering the police, retraining the police, and ensuring that police funds trickle down uh, to everybody, and then they're able to do their job so that there will be no repeat. Uh, if you arm the police the way it is armed now, automatically citizens will, uh, or criminals, certainly not citizens, criminals will tend to want to also arm themselves and um, overpower the, the police. So long and short is we are supposed to employ more of dialogue, uh, get trained more of dialogue, and discuss and ensure that things get better. Uh, for someone like E.K. Clark, the military must do due diligence. While the tempers are high and they want to quickly get at those who may be, who are suspects in this particular uh, incident, they must be careful not to agitate the equilibrium that is in that general area. Because going to Park Clark's house and not finding anybody there is a big embarrassment and should not repeat. So if you want to go anywhere, you must do what is called due diligence, follow due process, and ensure that you minimize uh, the uproar that is going on. Because people are apprehensive and people are afraid. But uh, yes, the military has re reassured us. But most times people are afraid because you think back at OD, you think back at uh, Umuchem, you think back at uh, some of the things that happened uh, in Ogoni land, and so on and so forth. So these are the issues, uh, Ruben Abati. Right. Now, l let's take a look at, um, you know, you've said that there have been a number of skirmishes, uh, but smaller in nature, that uh, this is uh, sort of business as usual in these, uh, some of these oil areas. Uh, my question to you is, what was it about this particular incident that made it so much more explosive than the other incidents uh, that you say normally happen in pockets? Uh, that's the first question. Then the second question is, I, I think you keep a a 
uh, alluding to sort of an equilibrium that exists right now, although things are tense, what needs to be done to completely de-escalate the situation in the short term? I know you've painted a picture of the long-term development and so forth, but in the short term, in the next couple of weeks, what can be done to douse tensions in this area? Yes, the military has to, to douse the tension in the area, the military has to deploy a different strategy, which is to use intelligence and all of those who can do that job. Of course, the DSS is there. Uh, some uh, um, uh, some uh, calls in the police will be, will be there as well. And then, of course, the military intelligence. So they go out and find these guys without necessarily steering everybody in their direction. And so before you know it, we've, uh, they've uh, arrested uh, suspect number one, and then suspect number two, and so on and so forth. They do not need to go with uh, all the armory, so to speak, in search of one or two persons. That bit they should do. Yes, uh, from the results, it's obvious that the suspects may be extremely dangerous. However, there has to be a way of putting the right experts as well to go without necessarily staring at the whole environment so that these things do not degenerate. In Bielsa State, for instance, since uh, Governor Doye Diri came on board four years ago, most of these things have reduced to zero. And so the last time when we heard that uh, a particular community was uh, everybody has run into the forest and so on and so forth, it wasn't a good thing to happen. So let them, as much as possible, ensure that each time they strike, they strike on target and not miss. And that way, they will dis, dis, uh, de escalate what, what is going on. I believe that that is, for me, going to be a good way forward uh, as far as this issue is concerned. Okay. <clears throat> de escalate temporarily. People are also saying, in fact, we had a Commodore here, Commodore Lamumi, that was saying there's also a political angle to it that we should check the politicians in the states. And there were some accusations against governors that it looked as though they were tilting and taking sides in all of this matter. I mean, what's your, what, what are you going to say as regards the political angle to it? Because this is how it works in the Niger Delta. There's a political side that fuels the resource theft and the resource angle to it, and there's an hegemony of power that is being kept. I mean, if you go back to the days of where you had a lot of militancy in that area. You still have a lot of militancy and bunkering going on anyway. And the fact that <laughs> political actors needed to talk to them about, you know, not impeding the economic trade in that area, opening Camp 5, as it were, you know, and ensuring that those vessels get into that area, get into worrying so that people could be able to trade and all of that. When you look at it, there's always a political angle that holds it and also, there's a resource angle to it, and it just works according to the lever. The question is, have these political leaders started again? Because what the commander said that is that we can't afford to fight on two fronts. It's going to be disastrous. We're fighting up in the north, we want to fight here again. At least after 20, 2007, we had some peace in that area. So what are you going to say as regards the political angle? Well, uh, for the political angle, I do not have much to say. I do know that some politicians use uh, non-state actors as thugs and so on and so forth. But it is the responsibility of the Nigerian police ordinarily, and then for the military that are helping the Nigerian police to ensure that uh, nobody uses any other citizen against the law. It is about the law, which means that uh, if you see an armed robber, for instance, with a particular uh, a political actor. He's an armed robber. He has to be apprehended and brought to justice. If you allow him be, then, of course, you have failed in the oath you took. So the law enforcement and the military must live up to the oaths they took and the training they've, uh, they've gotten. And like I said before, most of them need some more training. And so the Nigerian state should ensure that they are better trained so they know their responsibilities. It is bad enough, for instance, for any political actor to warehouse thugs, thugs with weapons, with arms and ammunition. It is completely wrong, and so law enforcement should do their job. And once that job is done, I can tell you, everybody will know his place. Well, when, the, when law enforcement, for instance, makes some people to appear untouchables, what you are doing is you are postponing the doomsday 
and so someday it will all backfire. Uh, we just finished uh, some elections, I think last year, and you know how those things went. You are the press. You know how those things went. So let us tell the truth and also request of uh, law enforcement to do their job. They should not just let things be because this is one big man and then the other man is a small man. No. So as far as I know, that is what the issue is. And for the details, I think uh, the lady asked before. Uh, what is specific things that are going on in Okwama? You are depressed. I've not been to Okwama. You should go and find out. Use every means uh, uh, possible to find out the real fact and let Nigerians know. Tell us what are the real facts, what triggered this particular one. But I've told you that from my history, from what I know, is a resource issue, much more than political issue at this time. Of course, uh, most of the elections are done. And so uh, it is not really a high season for politics per se. So I think that it is resources. And if I don't think, I know that it is resources, oil and gas resources, as not properly uh, managed in, that, in this part of the world. So uh, the Nigerian state, the president in particular, has to look at the things that are going on there and ensure that proper things are, the proper thing is done. You know that there is some level of divestment, and most of these uh, IOCs are playing uh, pranks. They are selling to their cronies. They are not even giving uh, the, the communities and the kingdoms and the states the offer of first refusal. Before you know it, they've sold. Before you know it, they've sold. So all of these are priming the environment for more and more of this type of showdown, which is completely avoidable. And we must work towards avoiding this type of mess from well, happening ever again. Your Highness, um, as an officer, yes, part, part of your you know, training was in international terrorism, global security, you know, and all of that. Now, I, I get the advice you are giving President uh, Tinubu. I think so far, in terms of managing the Niger Delta situation, is, uh, you know, good optics from his side. He has said all the right things. But if you were to advise him, dealing with the challenge of terrorism, banditry, you know, uh, uh, insurgency in Nigeria, generally, beyond Niger Delta, as a subject area expert, what would be your suggestions to him, briefly, as a wrap up? Well, this is a public television, but I will advise him to uh, dig deep, which means ask the right questions. Like maybe on Niger Delta, for instance, if you ask me the right questions behind the scene, there is so much I can reveal to you. If you read the book, The Riddle of the Oil Thief, for instance, there is so much you can see there. And it's the same story in the Northeast, for instance. Uh, and um, uh, I think about banditry. Bandits' uh, grandfathers were left in the forest without uh, education, and then their fathers were left in the forest uh, without education. They themselves left in the forest without education. And you remove all their sources of livelihood, you steal all their cows, and you give them guns and drugs. And then so, what is the outcome? That is what you are getting. So it has, it has been something that has been happening over the years and has now come to uh, like the high, the crest. And so Mr. President has to properly understand the background of all of these, that so many years ago, this and this and that was not done. And then so if you go this way, this is how the, the, uh, the results will be. And because there are also those who are politically, uh, politically positioned that are using this to feed fat, using this to gain traction and, and so on, it means that all those guys as well have to be uh, uh, the riot ha act has to be read to them. They have to be told how to do it. And of course, if they've gone, violated the rules, they must pay the right price by uh, getting justice. That way, I think Mr. President will uh, succeed. During his campaigns, I can tell you that I gave him a copy of the riddle of the oil thief that uh, his success, particularly in Nigeria and in the Niger Delta, will depend largely on his having to read and understanding that particular book. And I believe if he has done it, then uh, we should look at it. Some of these things will have been avoided in my mind. So discussion with the right experts, I can tell you, can make a whole world of difference. Right. King Buburaya Dakolo, we thank you so much for your time and your contribution this morning. It was absolutely insightful.